There are few spiritual leaders with a legacy as storied as Pastor Albert Femi Oduwole, a Harvard-educated teacher and innovator. Pastor Albert works at the cutting edge of performing consulting, leading a global team at Get Inspired INC. But ministry is his primary calling and the family his mission. His expertise is sought after and he has been invited to speak and mentor in Asia, Europe, Africa and America. Pastor Oduwole draws from the most poignant example of marriage, the union between Christ and the church, and teaches how to build christ -centered marriages. He has devoted 25 years to this ministry and has worked with couples to salvage and strengthen thousands of marriages through his virtual and physical love clinics. When he isn't helping couples repair and rediscover love, he shepherds the Triumphant Nation, a fast-growing network of churches under the umbrella of World Ablaze International Mission, a multi-faceted mission and ministry he founded with his wife and partner, TJ. Pastor Oduole is committed to the advancement of the gospel and the restoration of the family. He is a stellar leader and an enduring example of Christian excellence. Harvesters International Christian Center with a standing ovation, please give a warm welcome to Pastor Albert Femi Oduole. Are you blessed? The outside rain is a proof of the spiritual rain over your life. Amen. There is a rain pouring over you. The umbrella can't stop. Praise God. It's going to turn your life around. Make your life more beautiful. Make all things work together for your good. Them that hate you, we see the glory of God upon your life. God, we give you miracles that will make your mouth to open. In the name of Jesus. Get ready for a miracle this week. I love the Yoruba language. It is graphic. They said, Iyanu is that which makes your mouth to open. Ah. <laughs> ah. If your mouth is not opening, it's not a miracle. Look at your neighbor and say, your mouth will say, ah. When you say my next car, ah. When you attend my wedding, ah. When you visit my new home, ah. When you hear my this testimony, ah, and I thought miracle is the best, but I discovered that it's something greater than miracle. It is called wonder. Your rubas will say miracle is Iyano, but wonder is Agbayano, the senior brother of a mouth watering miracle. God is about to make your mouth to open. If miracle is ah, wonder is ah. ah are you ready for wonder? Are you ready for a wonderful way? Something God is about to happen. Something better is on the way. Give God a show. Hallelujah. Can we celebrate Pastor Paul again, Pastor Mo this morning? Praise God, you can be seated. Hallelujah. Such a joy to be here. If you are not in the first service, you can catch the message. Today I want to talk, this service I want to talk about matrimony. Somebody say matrimony. Not matrimony, but matrimony. All the books are at the book stand. You might need to pick a copy on your way out or buy for your friends and your neighbors. Matrimony, the balance between romance and finance. I wrote in this book, one thing is very interesting. There is no institution where marriage is taught. Yet, marriage is the only institution where they give you certificate before the learning. Every other institution you learn before you get certificate. In marriage, you get certificate first, then they tell you to go and learn. No wonder there is a lot of marital casualties in this world. When I got married, the church where we got married, the only counseling they give me is not to beat my wife. Of course, that reverend didn't like me. He showed it the way he pronounced her blessing. He looked at me, I bought her, I bought her, said, you, do you take this lovely lady as your lawfully wedded wife in sickness and in health for riches? Half a porter, <laughs> the dead. I wanted to say, excuse me, sir, let me go and think about it again. <laughs> That's the situation where marriage is not yet. Marriage is the only institution where they give you certificate before they give you 
learning. There are five places we learn everything we learn in this world. Five places. Number one, you learn whatever you learn from school. From school. But unfortunately, when it comes to school, they didn't teach us about marriage. Or did they teach you in your school? The only marriage, marriage they taught me in my school, the only husbandry they taught me was animal husbandry. <laughs> By the time I got married, I discovered that animal husbandry does not work in human husbandry. So in school, they didn't teach me about money. They didn't teach me about marriage. Number two, what they don't teach you in school, you thought you will learn at home. I said in the first service, that after years of counseling people in marriage, I started wondering, how come the guys that said, I'm going to be the best husband ever, and the ladies that say, I'm going to be the best wife ever, years after marriage, months after marriage, they're having a lot of problems. And I used to wonder, what is the major issue? Then I discovered that the guy that said, I'm going to be the best husband ever, I'd never seen a good husband before. The lady that said, I'm going to be the best wife you've ever seen, has never seen a good wife before. How do you become what you never beheld? How do you solve a problem when there was no example? Many people from home didn't even learn what it is to be a good marriage. Especially in Africa. By the time you are in your 20s, your father will call you and say, I'm the come, sit down. Now that you're a man, as if you don't know before. <laughs> say, be careful of this woman. You know what I suffer from? Mama Koroko, Mama Clara, Mama Chibuzo, and that Yoruba woman. The man trying to advise you as tried for women, nothing worked. And the Bible said the older women should teach the younger women how to love their husband. <laughs> this generation. The older women are teaching the younger women not to love their husband. You can't the trust man. You the trust man, Adam. Adam. You the trust man. So if you don't get it from school, if you don't get it from home, where can you get it from? Unfortunately, people now go to churches where they don't also get the right teaching. Put your hands together for other stars. Come on now. So every child that devotes a month to your marital life. So if you don't get it from home, you don't get it from school, you don't get it from church. There are only two more places. Number one, the streets. And like everything on the streets, what they teach is the crack. And that is where a lot of homes are in trouble. And I said in the first service, you need to know who you follow. Because social media is full of all nonsense. A lady put on a Twitter tweet, a tweet and said, I'm having some problem. I don't think I can go on. I think I need to quit. By the time she got back to her tweet the next day, there were over 2,000 messages. Dump his ass. Let him go. Oh, there are all of these men, masculine, toxic people. Come on, walk out. God will take care of you. Then she tweeted and said, I'm sorry. I gave you the wrong form. It's not about my husband, though. It's about work. <laughs> then the same people started tweeting back. Go stay in there. It gets better. God will make a way. Can you imagine a generation that wants you to quit your marriage at the drop of the heart, but stay hooked to your job for whatever reason? What a generation is that? Be careful who you follow on social media. Too many fakes there. Yeah. I said in the first service, who you follow determines what follows you. You are not following Pastor Bolaji, you are not following Pastor Mo, you are not following me on Instagram, you are following one Mr. Potable. I wonder why your marriage and your life is full of wala, 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 wala. <laughs> so Pastor Bolaji came here to lead us to pray for peace. Then you go back home to follow wala. What a life. Praise God. Hallelujah. And if you don't learn from those four places, then personal pursuit is important. You can't harvest where you do invest. I was doing consulting for a couple in America. They paid me quite some money. The husband has PhD in medicine. The wife has PhD in nursing. So money was not their problem. In the midst of the counseling, the woman said, Sir, one of the things that bother me the most is that how come in every other thing we're doing well, except this marriage? Our career is, on, is, is doing well. I mean, finances, is, how come is this marriage? I said, let's start with your career. How many books on medicine do you have? Oh, several. How many books on nursing do you have? Several. How many books on relationship do you have? Eh, we bought two one time, oh... I said, that's the problem. You can't have where you don't invest. If your marriage is critical to you, then you need to invest in materials and read it. Did anybody get that? 
So there is no way where marriage and money is taught. But you can learn it on your own. When it comes to matrimony, there are three different levels. Number one, just enough. Most of the time, we all start from just enough. Uh, not enough, sorry, not enough. Not enough for majority of the people means you don't have enough to do a lot of things you have to do. And most of the time, from not enough, you move to just enough. Just enough is when you have done everything, it's just enough. Then you move by the grace of God to more than enough. Can somebody say amen? amen. Most of the time, at not enough, there must be a lot of discussion. A lot of discussion. What do we... I remember when we just got married, I didn't like the fact that my wife didn't have good shoes. So I started saving money for her to buy the shoes. So I gave her the money. I said, this is money for your shoes. She said, thank you. I waited. You know the way husband is waiting to say, oh, that's the shoe. I didn't see it. <laughs> ha! The second week. I said, madam, come on. Where's the money I gave you for shoe? I've not seen the shoe. He said, she said, oh, you ate it. I said, me, we don't eat shoe in my family. She said, that's still you enjoy that you had. It's money for the shoe. I said, I didn't mean steel. I mean shoe. She said, yes, but steel is more important than shoe at this level. You know, there are things you remember in later life that makes you to spoil your spouse. Years after, I got into a store in London. I saw a shoe. I knew when God gave the design of that shoe, the design, God knew my wife. And I had, it was the days of Blackberry. I was so excited. I just sent her, I said, hey, babe, I saw a shoe here. That shoe, in fact. He said, don't buy it, don't bring the money. <laughs> then forget, at this level, you will buy shoe. <laughs> By the grace of God. Amen. So we move from not enough. We move to just enough. From just enough, we move to more than enough. At not enough, you have to debate everything. At just enough, by the time you... That just enough is when your friends and your family believe you have married a witch. You know what I'm talking about? Because they say, oh, that guy used to be very liberal until he gets married. That guy, they don't know that that is not the case. By the time you maintain your two cars and you pay your children's school fees. <laughs> I told people in church, ushers especially. I said in September, be careful how you talk to people. September is not easy for parents. So you are not a parent. You don't know what I'm talking about. You are paying tuition. And some of it in foreign currency. So when Usher, look at, this is where I'm sitting. <laughs> when you are driving around Lekki in September, be careful. People are thinking. Not, then you move to more than enough. Interestingly, there are a few things you need to do at not enough and just enough that will help you when it comes to matrimony. I call it the ABC of not enough and just enough. The A, number one, appraiser. Appraiser. Appraise everything before you buy. I told you my wife said at that time steel was more important than shoe. Appraise it. I wrote here, I said, high taste without high income will lead to high blood pressure. Did you hear that? At not enough or just enough, it's not the time to buy uh, Jojo. But no, buy Jojo Fasini. Buy what you can afford. Is anybody? You are not able to buy Ralph Lauren. You might be able to buy Ralph Lauren. You don't even cut your coat according to your size. You cut it according to the clothes. Did you get a, a praise? Number two, budget. Budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Number three, at not enough and just enough, continuous development. A, B, C, A for appraiser, B for budget, C for continuous development. Have discovered that many at times people tell you, if you want more, work more. No, if you want more, be worth more. Does anybody get that? Yes, so your duty in marriage at that time is to propel and compare one another to get better. I remember years ago, I, 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 I drove into my house. The gate, I opened the gate for us. Then I had my wife asking the gate man, so the book I gave you, have you read it? <laughs> when we entered to my house, I said, TJ, why are you disturbing a book with book? His job is to open gate. TJ said, no, no, no. That she saw him reading one day, I saw that the guy could read. So after that, she will give him books. The guy will read it and tell her what he read. So the next day I called the guy, I said, come here. 
Madam say you they read book. He said, Yes, I they read. So what are you doing here? He said, they gather money, go to university and don't get money. I said, Do you have do, do, have, have you passed away? He said, No, but but I'm planning to write that. I said, if I give you money, will you pass? He said, I'll go try. So I gave him money to get the form. The guy clear my egg. I said, if I give you money for jam, you fit pass? He said, yes. I said, no, I will get you a train. I said, I don't need teacher. I go pass. I said, no. So I got him a teacher. The second week he came to me. He says, I don't want to make you waste money on uh, teacher. I, I do him well. He did jam and cleared it. He graduated from university this year. And we kept on sending him money. Listen, if that guy will come back to our employment, he won't be gate man. Yes. Not because he's working more, but he's now worth more. Yes. But you see, it's very interesting to me that most marital crises did not start at not enough and just enough. Most marital crises start at more than enough. Because that is when you can say, honey, sorry, I forgot to tell you, my dear Paul, I saw a cheap ticket. To seashells. I'm on my way. And you know the thing about Africa is Africa helps you when you have money to destroy your marriage. Can I explain to you why? Number one, once you have some money, you have two different cars. Number two, you now build a big house. You have madame bedroom, master's bedroom. But you've forgotten that the basic places of communication in a home is in the car and on the bed. When you just woke up or when you're just about to sleep. And money has destroyed those two major points of communication for you because you are now prosperous. I used to argue with my wife in those days. She would say, if you are going to the same place, we are driving the same car. I said, why now? Drive your own. Let me drive my own. She says, no. But now I know why. Because many a times, we would drive home and then we would stay in the car one more hour. Just No disturbance. It's very beautiful to do. Don't let money destroy your marriage. ABC of more than enough. Number one, availability. Be available for one another. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed, not the bed. So that you don't be bed in a home. Be available. Spend time together. Number two, budget together. You know the first one I said budget. This time it's not just budget, it's budgeting together. You know what I discovered what happens when you have money? Sometimes you're going out, you're like, oh, we need this and you bought it. Not then your wife had bought the same thing. Now you get home together, you have too many of things you don't need, and there are several things you need you've not bought. But get together. My wife and I, as a pastor, discovered that some people will ask me for money, I give them. Then they go and ask my wife for money, my money gives them. So my wife gives them. So at the end of the day, they have more than we ever could imagine because we didn't discuss it together. But get together, people are smart in this generation. Yeah. Then number three, develop covenant sense. It makes all the difference. Develop covenant sense. There are so many things I can say, but I really don't have too much time. I would have loved to talk about financial gender roles in, in, in marriage and financial temperament in marriage. Because interestingly, marriage and money has temperaments too. Most of the time, if you marry somebody that is choleric in money management, they believe money is a means to an end. So you say, only, <laughs> I need to see the doctor. No, we are saving for a new car. Those are cool. If you marry a sanguine, ah, money is for flexing. Yeah. Eh? Oh, that money had come, let's cruise. If you marry a phlegmatic, they like to use their money to take care of other people at the expense of themselves. If you marry a melancholy, every cobble must be accounted for. And most of the time, the ones that are very spendthrift, marry the one that wants to spend anyhow. Don't look at your husband, be looking here. <laughs> that is where there is a lot of problem. But let me say this to you very quickly. Many a times when we are talking about money, unfortunately the emphasis of some people, pardon me, especially ladies, is marry a rich man. But you see, it's better for you to make your expectation to be rich than to marry rich. Did anybody get what I'm saying? I met a lady in India and I said to me, said, I'm the doctor that my parents wanted me to marry. Put your hands again. Very important. I love to say that when you read Proverbs 31, 
I thought when we were growing up, the prostitute one is about a, a man that is a, 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 a woman that is submissive and all that. No! It's about a woman that made money. Yes, sir. Yeah, boss lady, thank you. Go and read it. To start with, Proverbs 31 is a, is a proverb by Solomon. But Solomon said, it is not me that had it to. It was my friend that I had it from. And it is the proverb his mom taught him. So it was a proverb the mom of King Lamuel taught King Lamuel. He discovered that even if you don't have a mother to teach you, if your friend has a mother to teach him, you can learn from your mother's friend. Yeah. The word ignorance is from the word ignore. It is ignorance. Which means that wisdom is everywhere if you are ready to find it. So Solomon found it, and the woman was talking about, about it was a letter to men. We use it to teach women. It's a letter to men. He was telling kings two things that will destroy your destiny, women and wives. They started talking about the woman that will enhance your destiny. Oh my God, very profound thing. You know, when you read your Bible, you wonder why somebody like Jacob was crazy about Rachel. They said, Leah has beautiful eyes, but it's Rachel he wanted. He worked seven years for Rachel. They swindled him. He said, I work cannot. What makes a man work 14 years for one woman? <laughs> he had been having sex with Rachel, uh, with Leah, for seven years, but still wanted Rachel. So sex does not keep a man. Value does. Genesis 29, verse 29, said, when he saw Rachel, he saw a girl leading sheep, being industrious, and trapped a boss lady. That is what attracted him. Even when Leah had the first child, he named the child, now my, he named the child, now my husband will love me. He still didn't love her. The second one, now he really love me. He still didn't love her. The third one, now he really, really love me. Then the fourth one, he said, well, I give it up to God. <laughs> Even when Jacob thought they were going to die. They were going to meet his son. He arranged things according to priority. Sheep and goat, followed by Leah and the children. They are next to sheep and goat. Never marry a man that does not like you. Never. Be industrious. Let me show you some of the things the Bible says about this woman. Verse 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her because he knows he will have no lack of gain. Bible in basic English said, the heart of her husband has faith in her. He will have profit in full measure. The husband knows, with this kind of a wife, I can't fail. They ask a net plan. They say, what is your secret for motivation? He said, Gloria. He said, no, we mean the secret for, he said, yeah, said, Gloria is enough secret for 10 men. Marry right. Marry right. It changes everything. Verse 13. The Bible says she's industrious and creative. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hand. I mean, basic English really like this. She gets wool and linen and working at the business of her hands. Wow. Verse 16. Good news Bible. She looks at a land and buy it. The lucky, not just the jacket, do you mean? She bought it from her prophet and she plants a vineyard. Good news Bible says she looks at land and buys it. What a woman. Verse 18 says she perceived her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out at night. She created a system that even makes money while she's sleeping. Hello? You know, it's not every wife they will send for from the in-laws house to come and help them to cook. There is party tomorrow. Hello? I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Oh, you can't imagine it. It's every wife where they will say, oh, so the party is tomorrow. When are you arriving? There are some wives that we send caterers yes. three days ahead. Yes. <laughs> hey. I told people, I said, the problem in this generation, we're trying to date a rich man. Is that even when he breaks up with you, it is the gate man that we tell you. But God said, make a no open gate again. <laughs> Did anybody get what I just said? Make your own money. Verse 24 says she makes garments. 
clothes, belts, sells them to merchants. What a woman. She makes a lot of money. But this is the problem. The desire to marry a rich man had made many people marry Nabal instead of Boaz. Nabal has money. Boaz has money. But Nabal was a wicked man. I've discovered a lie. Look at, when the first time I read 1 Samuel 25 verse 3, the Living Bible if you have it, 1 Samuel 25 verse 3, I couldn't comprehend it. Look at what the Bible said. The Bible says his, his name was Nabal and his wife. Look at how the Bible describes his wife. In 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 3, his wife was a beautiful, very intelligent woman named Abigail. But the man, what's an opposite? A descendant of Caleb, uncouth, churlish, stubborn, ill-mannered. How did Abigail marry a man like this? Basili told us, number one, is from the descendant of Caleb. Don't marry family name. Marry a man. Do you get what I'm saying? Don't marry family name. Marry a man. It's very important. Number two, don't marry prosperity, marry demand. Look at the next verse. The Bible said he has 3,000 sheep. A lot of people had married sheep instead of the man. I wrote a few things here. I said, number one, don't marry a man because he has television. Marry him because he can tell you a vision. Did anybody hear me? Don't marry what a man is driving. Marry what is driving him. What is driving him will determine sometimes what you will drive. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. Don't marry. Tell, and you see, <laughs> I said this somewhere. I said, a lot of people have left a man of vision for a man that has television. But one day they'll be watching the man of vision on the husband's old television. Kai! That thing they pay no. Another one. Don't marry prosperity. Marry the person. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 5, blink of an eye, money can disappear. Another one. This one, I used to preach it wrongly for years. Marry potential, marry potential, marry potential. Excuse me, I've changed my mind. Don't marry potential again. Marry pattern. There are people I knew 30 years ago that have potential. They still have potential now. Marry pattern. Where was he yesterday? Where is he today? Where was she last year? Where is she now? It is the pattern that proves the person, not the potential in him. No man goes far by potential alone. If you don't put action to potential, you stay on the same spot. Is anybody together? So, don't marry Naba. Don't choose based on sources. 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Don't choose based on family name. Marry somebody that loves you and loves God. You know, this is what I've discovered. One of the problems I have personally as a person is that some of you, you marry a guy that does not regard, regard God or man. And when you now have problem, you are talking to God, you are talking to man. Listen to me, singles. I'm having a special session with singles in the fourth service. Don't go. Make sure you stay. Never marry somebody that you have to repent in the marriage, and say, God, I was, first of all, say, I'm sorry that, well, that, that you told me, you didn't tell me to marry him, I marry him. Don't. Marry somebody that you'll be saying, but God, I thought you told me to go ahead. Don't marry somebody that despises pastors. Because knowing that when you have problem with the marriage, you will need pastors to help you solve it. People are now saying, hey, pastor, please come and let my husband come talk to you. The husband that you know does not regard pastor becomes a problem. When it comes to matrimony, the first place to start, I don't have too much time, is raising your children well where money is concerned. If you remember, if you were in first service, you say, I talk quite some about marriage, I talk to singles, and I talk about parenting. Why? Because unfortunately, we live in a generation where people that are not well parented are now parenting. Did you get that? In fact, let me tell you where the problem is. So the people that were not well-parented started parenting. 
So the third generation of not unwell parented are now getting married. You know, there's a big problem. And you need to raise your own kids well so that the ones that were not well parented will not corrupt your home. Some of us grew up in homes where your parents, all they taught you about money is by not giving you money. Hello? If I decide, no, your FCC is not working. If they want to work, they should start with mother. Not only will mommy not give you money, any money visitor give you, mommy will say, let me keep it for you. <laughs> The day you say, Mommy, that money on Kuji, eh, hey, all the food they are eating in this house, the burgers they are bought, go and bring it. Why are you laughing and see if your mommy is like that? <laughs> if your mommy is in church, you don't look at how. Go and bring everything. But I decided to go a different route. Growing up as I travel the world, whenever I'm going, I call my three children and give them money. Not because I have a lot, and not because I want to give. But I want to come back and ask them, how did you spend the money? Major way to raise kids where money is concerned. Some of the problem we are having in marriage today was parenting problem. So when I come back, I'm asking my first girl, how did you spend your money? I did, 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 did okay, the second one. So what did you do? Did, did, did. My son, I don't know where that one came from. Is he Jebu Pro Max? His answer is the same every time. So what do you do with the money? I saved it. The one that I said, so this money you are saving, what are you doing with it? Say, ah, let me tell you. Mommy, owe me. If I, Barbara, owe me. <laughs> you a bank. <laughs> Everybody is owing you. I raised my children on the Oduwale spending scale. That when money comes into our hand, number one, we sow. All my children know that. Number two, we save. Number three, we settle. Number four, we spend. Number five, spare. The five S of the Abba to do all this spending scale. When money comes into our hand, the first thing is that we sow. I raise my children to give up. I don't know what your doctrine is, but I raise my children to pay tithe. As a covenant to God and, it's, and a consistent place of honor. I was sure when I went to do a, 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 a certification course in Harvard, and they were teaching me in strategic leadership about giving 10% of your earning to charity. I say, yeah, what the church is debating, the world is accepting. You know, there is something about the person of Jesus that gives us access to heaven. There is something about the principle of Jesus that makes us successful on earth. Yes, the world is taking the principle, they are throwing away the person. The church is taking the person and taking away the principle. That is a big minus. So I teach them so fast. If you are blessed with money, give us. I know it's exciting. It's exciting because, I mean, I... I <laughs> Then, after you sow, you save. After you save, you settle all your bills. After you settle, then you can spend. So for my children, they knew that spending is number four. For most people, they think spending is number one. Money has come, let's spend. Raise your children differently. We did that to move house in Toronto one time. My children are there. My wife and I were here, so we couldn't. You know what? The thousands of dollars, it was my daughter, my first girl at 25, that handled all the deal. Everything. She made the payment. I transferred the money to her. She transferred it. My major credit card right now is with my children. And I have no fear for now they spend it. <laughs> Can I go a bit practical? Let me tell you what we did with our children. Because my time is almost running up. This is what we did with my children. Once they are born, people give us money when children are born. We use that money to open accounts for them. Because if you, are, if you think very well, it's not your money. They didn't give you that money yesterday, don't you? Children come. It's meant to be the children's money. Stop stealing people's money. <laughs> <laughs> we use the money to open an account for them. Then we use from that account to buy shares for them. And then as time goes on, I keep on putting in money there, you know, and all that. When they are 13, I lead them to the bank. It's a ritual, something we look forward to in my family. I lead them to the bank and say, well, let's move the account from a child's account to a teen's account. The thing about a teen's account is they cannot have access to a, to a cash card, ATM card. But, you know, at that level also, all their lot still comes to me. It's their money, but I see their lot. And you see, it's always exciting for me when I send their, 
their, their monthly allowance to the account and immediately I get notification their tithe is gone out. Wow. Wow. I feel good as a father. I'm excited as a father. And sometimes if they withdraw anything major, I'm calling them. Until one day, one of them showed me. I saw an alarm. I said, hey! I called her immediately. But as she picked the phone, she was laughing. And I was hearing laughter at the background. I said, why, why, why are you laughing? He said, Daddy, the money is my pledge in church. I said, no, but why are you laughing? He said, when I withdrew the money, I told my friend. I said, my daddy will call now. One, two. And me too, momentously. It was on number four when the phone rang. And they were laughing. I said, yeah. I said who? God will forgive me. I said, who told you that's why I'm calling? Eh? Can the father not check on the daughter again? <laughs> said, Daddy, I know you. This is not checking on the daughter. When they are 21, finally we go to the bank again. This time around to transfer everything to them. I don't need to be your... If at that time they can't manage their money, I'd fail. Teach your children to sow, to save. I was very, very, very excited. So, so last, last month, one of my daughters just uh, sent me some dollars. Uh -uh. And I said, what's this? He said, well, it's partly profit offering and partly your allowance. I said, allowance how? He said, ah, you've given us allowance all like our life now. It's now your turn. We'll be giving you allowance. So <laughs> two days ago, the older one to send money to my girl. I said, what is this? Ah, Daddy, you are still asking. It is both a prophet offering and allowance. I say, yeah. Some of you, you're right, say, what do you do? is when they give the baby treat, you quickly take it. I mean, it. No, that's not how to do it. Raise your kids well. Raise them well. Be deliberate and intentional about it. Sometimes, if God bless you with 10,000 naira, Give your two-year-old, your three-year-old to hold and count. Let them, let them have a romantic relationship with money. Be deliberate about it. Is anybody hearing me? Yes, sir. Teach them well. So, we sow. We say. We settle. Because Christians are very funny. They will spend before they settle. Have you seen somebody give testimony of how God blessed them financially and the person they are owing is in church? <laughs> <laughs> Believers. Then, after you spend, there must be spare. So, when my kids are growing up, when we are traveling and they say, Daddy, I want this, I say, put it on the spare list. So, my children grew up knowing that it's a spare list. A spare list is a list of, after we have done the essentials, if there is anything remaining, we move to the spare list. Now, let me tell you something. I taught them also that the spare list is your arena of faith. Are you listening to me? I, I love Psalm 44, verse 3. He said that our fathers told us that this land, they did not get it by labor. They got it by favor. It was faith that got it for them. Your children must grow up knowing that faith can produce things. You must be able to go to your garage and tell your children, this one I got with that one. This one I labored to get. That one my faith produced. Your children must know that faith is a producer. Am I talking to somebody in this house? I came out of my room one day. My son said, Daddy, you are looking good. I said, thank you. He said, where did you buy this suit? He said, well, now you will say somebody gave you. I said, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say to you. But somebody gave me. He said, do they give to you because you are a pastor? I said, there are pastors they are not giving to. They gave to me because my faith can produce this. Raise your children in faith. The greatest legacy you can leave for your children is not money, it's faith. There are times government will fail. Things will go bad. But their faith must be strong to get results for them. Teach your children that if they are on minimum wage, they should be on maximum faith. Am I talking to somebody in this house? If you take all their money, you might slow them down. But if you take their faith, you will stop them. Raise your children to walk by faith. Where money is concerned. One day, my first girl, years ago, when phone just came, he said, Daddy, I need this kind of phone. You know they know phone more than us. I look at that phone, how much they sell it? I said, fathers don't give children this kind of phone. He said, so where do they get it from? 
I said, they believe God for it. She said, I'll believe God for it. I laughed. I left the house. I came to Lagos here to preach. I finished preaching. Somebody followed me to the hotel. Two envelopes. One small, one big. The small one, it was money inside they gave to me. The big one, I was already imagining what is inside and thanking God. Hello, I love envelopes. I don't know about you. <laughs> then she moved it towards me and said, well, sir, this is not for you. This is for um, your child. I said, who? He said, Barbara. I said, ah, what's this? He said, it's a phone I bought for myself for yesterday. But once I bought it, I just kept on feeling it's not my own. That it is our own. I say, yeah. Why did I not use my feet? <laughs> so my daughter started using a phone better than mine. Because she believes. God does not honor age. God honors faith. <laughs> I discovered at a time that as I traveled the world, I finished preaching. Somebody will come to me. I say, excuse me, sir. What's your wife's shoe size? And I'm thinking, me that I'm before your very before. And they will say, please, what's your wife's dress size? Ah! So I came back on one day. I said, I might be bringing it for you, but I'm just wondering what the problem is. He said, no, no, that's my confession. I said, what do you mean your confession? He said, as you're going, I'm saying, as it goes, he's bringing back my goods. He's bringing, I said, God, don't catch you. Then I discover. She's using her faith that me, I will be an Ashiru. <laughs> Go and carry and bring. Me that is going, I wasn't releasing my faith to get. God honors faith because faith honors God. Stand on your faith. Let's close this out. Did anybody get blessed? Yes, Did you learn something new? Yes, the book is going to be at the stand. There are some other books. Prostitutes approach the business. I used to wonder why prostitutes don't do billboard, they don't do ad bill, they don't do complimentary card, they don't do TV and radio advert. Then I wonder in every economic doom, they have a boom. The secret is here. Unlocking power for experts will change your prayer life. Seven things champions do before breakfast. I studied a thousand champions to know this secret. I love my spouse, but for about 30 years, people have said to me, I love my husband, but I love my wife, but in the third service, I'll be teaching what to do with your but. How to find and keep true love? People told me it's difficult to find now. And some say it's difficult to keep now. So I wrote a book on where to find, how to find, and then how to keep. Ten reasons why marriages fail. Ten reasons, why, ten simple things I taught in the first service that will make your marriage to work. I wrote in this book, how social media, several ways social media can destroy your marriage. I wrote in this book, nine ways that long-distance relationship can work. Surviving betrayal. You go to your breakfast. Either in relationship or in ministry, it is not avoiding it surviving. You need to know how to survive. My latest book, Simple Solutions to Complex Problems. Not every complex problem needs a complex solution. A good book for you. Marimatics, the, the almighty formula for marrying right. You have learned mathematics in school. You need to learn mathematics in life. Then I still do how to make love last forever. Some people that said I do. And I'm saying, I'm done, I'm done for, I'm not doing again, I'm done, done. But you can keep on doing. Put your right hand on your chest, let's pray. Father, we ask for grace. Matthew 19, 11. He said, not everyone is matured enough to make marriage work. It requires certain aptitude and grace. Marriage is not for everyone. Lord, supply the grace in the name of Jesus. I pray for them that are not married, that you will lead them right. I pray for them that are married, that you make their marriage to work. Change the narrative in families where marriages don't work. Make their case an exception. I give you praise and I give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we'll pray.